We are back with carving our fantasy door. Let me get this peg on this. So that's where we ended up yesterday. We ended up carving where we had the stones carved. We left the space for the door. We left the bottom alone. We'll figure it. We'll, we'll fiddle around with that today. I laid out my tools here. I've got about eight tools. And if you're not sure what these numbers are on them, you'll find numbers like 11, which means it's a number 11 sweep, where it goes completely down and comes all the way back around with sides. You get one on here that says, let me find one, 41. So here's this do by 41. I don't know if you can see that number there. Where's that thing at? It's right there, 41. 41 is right here. So 41 would be a V-tool, and then you choose the size. Is it 1 8 across? Is it 3 16 across? Is it 5 16 across? So you just choose what size you want. I think this one's probably a 1... I don't know. Let's guess it. Let's ch check it. Looks like it's about not quite a quarter inch, so we're talking mm, 3 16 So that would be a number 41. 60 degree, the 42 is V60 and in, in a little bit narrower. And so that these numbers correspond to what type of, of, of tool it is. So you can pull this off of the, the woodcarver's warehouse whittling shack and it'll, it'll tell you everything you need to know about which tools to order and what they have available. Okay, I'm going to reach for my glove wherever the heck I put it. There it is. Because I don't, again, it's embarrassing to cut yourself when you're supposed to be showing everybody what to do. So I did not do anything between when I saw you the last time and this time. And so we did say that we were going to look at different types of doors and what we wanted to put on them. And I had a different, knocked them over there. I had said we were going to do something kind of like this, but kind of like this too. And so I like this idea right here. I like the idea of the pull ring, ring pull. I like the idea of the hinges, and I like the idea of big boards. Now, we can get as wild and crazy as we want to, as, as Bob Ross will say. You can have all kinds of wood grain going on these. You can do anything you want. My suggestion is to pull off the one you want, off the web, print it, and have it available there for you to see at all times. I've got this laying right here against my computer. That one is simply just boards, and then we've got hinges. So I'm going to put those hinges in first, and the first one starts down here at the bottom. Looks like it goes all the way across, make it a little wider and thicker near the door. And actually, that one has some, some taper to it, so we're going to figure out where we want to go with that. So if you can see that... I just drew that stuff right there. I'm going to put it with a marker. So hopefully you can see it a little bit better. I'll try to match them up as far as size goes. And I'm going to have, it looks like I'm going to have a bunch of little rivets on the door. The little rivets holding it in place. So we'll just randomly put, you know, one, two, three. Seems like a good number. One two, three, something about art and odd numbers. I don't know how I'm going to get a little ring, but you know what? I'm, I, I, I'm going to fake that. I'm going to get a ring, a metal ring, or something off of a... Maybe I've got something in my box of possibles in there, and we'll figure that out later. But it looks like it's got a knob right there that comes out, and the ring goes through that thing. So that you pull up the ring and pull it, and it's anchored to the door that way. It shows a couple of rivets over here beyond the door so we're going to put a couple of rivets in there I'm not sure other than for st stability why that would be there but you know we'll look on that and if we just start randomly drawing lines down here for the boards it doesn't really matter where I put them as long as I don't go through a rivet because a rivet in the middle of a middle of a, a seam for the door would make sense would it seems like you'd have issues with it being stable Having never built a Hobbit or Fantasy door, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing. 
I deliberately did not make this really flat and smooth. I don't want this thing to look like it came out of a factory. I want it to look like, you know, Bilbo or a, a gnome or whoever made this thing and it's not entirely perfect and it doesn't have to be. I'm not looking for perfection. I don't really care about perfection. I'm looking for, does it look like what I wanted when I had it in my head? And sometimes that's part of the problem. What's in my head doesn't necessarily always come out. Anyway, I'm back to using my V-Tool. This one I think is, says, says it's a 41, so we're looking at a V-Tool that's about a 60. And somewhere between 3 sixteenths and a quarter inch, something like that. I don't, I, again, measuring is, is a problematic on here because we got them in inches and we got them in centimeters. And so it looks like it's about 5 millimeters across. Roughly, again, about a quarter of an inch, ish. I'm going to go across and I just want to, let me zoom in just a little bit. Figure out where that button is. There we go. Zoom in and I'm just going to go right in and just, I'm going across grain. So I'm going to just go outside those lines. I want to stay outside the lines that I drew because I don't want the hinge to be any smaller than that. So we're just carving those in. And you can make them as deep as you want. These don't have to be very deep. We can, we can deepen them later. Going around the corner is a little bit trouble, so I'm going to make sure that I'm holding it well. And I'm just letting the V-tool follow the line that I drew to match the contour on the other side. And do the same thing down here. Know that the wood underneath is going to be very forgiving, the wood of the door going to be very forgiving because you get to you get to do whatever you want to on that I mean do you want doors that look like they're highly lacquered do you want doors that look like they're kind of rough and they belong in the forest again that's your choice so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a, a flat gouge I'm just going to deepen these just a little bit more and I'm going to take a flat gouge well let me first take a sharp knife and score those lines down there. So again, this is a Pinewood Forge knife. Dell Stubbs makes those and they're really good. Short, stiff, heavy blade. I know Helvey makes one similar. OCC, KCT makes one similar. You can find this type of knife just about anywhere with anybody. So use whichever knife you feel more comfortable with. If you if you like a flex cut or you like a Stubai or you like a Helvey, Get the one that fits you. Don't get one that doesn't fit, and don't get one that just because it's high priced it must be very valuable. I'm not a I'm not a big proponent of sitting out here collecting knives. I've bought knives over the past, and I've got a lot of them sitting around that I don't use, and I need to just pass them on. And I have some that were donated to me by the family of a man who played around with knives. He did a lot of fun stuff, and he made tools out of kitchen knives and whatever. And, I'll probably put those on eBay here soon. Anyway, I'm going to try, I want to. I don't want to smash into that, so I'm just going to creep up to it. And I'm just going to lower the level right around that hinge so of the wood so that it looks like the hinge sticks out just a little bit. I don't need to take off a lot. I'm not trying to take off a big gouge here. I might be taking off a sixteenth, maybe even an eighth, but I doubt that I'm even going that deep. But I'm just going deep enough so that I can make it look like the door sits by sits behind with a with a hinge there on it use whatever i like a flat tool here because it, it allows me to flatten the door just a little bit and all we've done is just move that hinge in in the door a little bit we'll do that all the way around Again, if you're more comfortable doing this with a knife, feel free to do it with whatever you got, or a chisel. If you got a chisel laying around, a flat chisel, straight chisel number one, even a number three would work. This one is a number three. It's Dubai. Works perfectly. I know I said I was going to talk about Stubai, because that's what I'm primarily using on this on this this video. Here's the thing. Normally by now, I'm sorry. Normally by now I would have stopped and stropped a little bit. I don't feel the need to do that yet. Maybe it's because they're brand new. Maybe it's because it's, it's that um, Austrian steel. But I don't feel like I've got to go in here and strop them every 
15 or 20 minutes. This video is, the first video was, is, is about an hour, not quite an hour. This one will be a little bit shorter. But I've, I, I feel like I don't really have to go sharpen and, and strop every time. And not sharpen, they don't need to be sharpened unless I did something wrong with them. But strop. I have not had felt the need to strop yet. And so let's hope that keeps up because more time stropping is less time carving. I got a little bow right here in the door, that's okay. I'm going to redraw my lines that I put on there. So I know where my V tools are going to go. And I'm not worried about being perfect on these lines. If I mess up on a line, I can always make it look like there are there's grain on that door. Okay. Oh, missed the spot. All right. We're going to go into each one of those spots and I'm just going to follow that line using that same V tool I've been using. And I'm just going to follow those lines. And when I say outline and follow lines, what I mean is the bottom of that V, I want that line that I drew to be removed with that V tool. Hard to get in these, use a switch to a smaller one if you have a hard time doing that. But all I'm doing is just removing these lines. That, that they're denoting, they're, they're signifying that's where the board is. That's where the, the piece of wood that makes up the door itself. I don't want to spend all day on this. I want to get I want to get to the carving part and we're almost done with carving on the door. And then I want to get to carving on the gnome or hobbit, whichever one you decide to do. Gnome is kind of more distinctive has the has you know generally has the pointed hat and the beard. Uh, the hobbits are a little bit a little bit more have a little more character to them in terms of the way they the distinctive way that they dress and the way their hair is. If you remember the the movies, the Lord of the Ring movies or the Lord, Lord of the Ring books, the illustrations. When I was when I was a kid, it, I was fascinated by looking at the illustrations. I wasn't so much crazy about the story as much as I was some other types of material I was reading. But I thought the the pictures, and I don't remember I don't remember who did the who did the illustrations for that, but I thought they were pretty good. In fact, I, f I think I found a, a picture book in the library that showed, you know, Bilbo and all the others. Pictures of them, and I thought that was the coolest thing I'd seen. I keep going back and making sure I take off all this black stuff, the line, the line that I drew. And what that does is that deepens that cut in the middle for the for the door as well, the door planks. I'm going to take a, v, a, a, a wood burner to this, at least for a little bit, just to add some character. Because sitting here drawing all the lines on a door, all these lines of wood grain, can get very tedious with a with a with a V tool, and so with a U, with a wood burner, I can get in there and just have a little bit of fun, deepen all the corners in here, get that out. Unfortunately for me right now, as I said earlier in the earlier video, <laughs> excuse me, we're remodeling the house, and I couldn't tell you where the wood burner is, so I may not get to that for this project. But just know that I would come in here and add lines to to show the, the the grain of the wood that's in the in the pictures feel free to make whatever lines you need to make to make them look realistic and probably since i said that about my v2 or my wood burner i'm remembering that it's not here so it's going to be hard for me to find that anywhere so i'm going to i'll switch to a smaller v2 and we'll just add some lines and you can you can certainly just come in there feel free to add knots but I'm just gonna make a few random lines don't make them straight like you would maybe hair or something but I'm just I'm, I'm alternating these lines and some of them will run together because if you've ever seen wood at this lumber store or logs down on the ground or whatever these these tree lines can just run in all kinds of directions depending on the wood grain if you're talking about maple or oak you put it fairly straight 
lines of, of grain, but if you're talking about something like a mahogany or even an alder, they can get a little bit wonky. There's one called curly maple. If you're doing doors, a door out of a curly maple tree, you're going to have grain lines going just about everywhere. And let's not even talk about burls or things like that where the wood has just responded to pressures and it, it squirts out some really, really wonky wood that just curls in all kinds of different directions. I am just kind of just keeping it simple. In scouting, we always talked about Kismith, K-I-S-M-I-F, if those of you know what I'm talking about. And basically, was keep it simple, make it fun. So this should be a fun project for you because the great thing about this is there's no perfection on this at all. There's not going to be. And it shouldn't be. This should be a whimsical. I have a friend that calls it whistical. But, and I think he does that on purpose because he laughs when he does that. He calls them whistical buildings when you, when you make bark buildings. His name is Beck, so I reach out to Beck and tell him he's in one of my videos. But these should not be a perfect building. These should be things that you that come straight out of your imagination. Go ahead and make the wood wonky and curly and whatever it is. Feel free to experiment. Feel free to have fun. This is just wood, folks. And w this basswood, I know it may be expensive if you buy it off eBay or you get it off Amazon and you may not get the best stuff you're looking for. Another reason why you should attend at least some shows where they have vendors because then you can really get to touch the wood. You can see how light it is. You can see how wide it is. You can see how much grain it has on it. We're, we're lucky that we live in a place where we can we have people coming through or people that we can call up and they can ship us some good stuff. Of course, that's true of any place. Heineke does some good wood. You can find it from Treeline. You can find it from Woodcarver's Warehouse. We have a guy in Salt Lake by the name of Tom Checkets that comes through here. He's got family that lives up here. And so Salt Lake is only five or six hours here. He has a big customer here called High Desert Hardwoods and they, they order a lot of wood from him. And so when he comes up here, he asks if we want some basswood. And it's like, not only yes, but heck yeah! Because he brings some good stuff. This is, this, is, this is part of his wood. And, you know, he doesn't, um, because it's already on the truck with the high desert hardwood sale that they're doing, he can give it to us for a, a you know relatively good price. And so when he comes through, I buy I buy everything that I see that I like. So I've got I've always got good wood, and people buy some wood from me when they just need a piece or two in our club. But I'm always looking for good wood and then this this stuff right here that's one inch it can be hard to come by sometimes because it, it wouldn't but only be six inches wide or something and so getting it in one by eleven by four foot long kind of can be a problem but Tom supplies it for me and I'm, I'm gonna reach out to him I've also bought it from Heineke Heineke makes some superior wood and so I would put Tom's I would put Tom's wood right up in there because he works with a guy named Jim Grace that lives in Iowa. I think that's where Jim moved to. He used to live in Salt Lake. Jim Grace supplies wood for Tom, and it's always been good. Tom and, and Jim have come to our wood show for several years, and it's always nice to, to be able to touch the wood, feel it, and see it, and whether it's butternut or jelly tong or tupelo or whatever else my bird carving buddies want to do. All right, so I've got a tooled door here. One of the things I like to do to make it look like it's not perfect is come down here at the bottom and make some deeper cuts in there. So I'm going to take a bigger V-tool, and I'm going to make it look like the door is rotted out just a little bit. So in some of those grooves, not, reg not, not regularly across, not like do 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 I'm, I'm random randomizing. <laughs> is that a word? I'm randomizing the cuts. Some of them are going to be even even deeper because I'm going to come in here and you can see what I've done. I've made some of these cuts a little bigger. I'm going to come in here on side on, on with a knife and just deepen a few of those cuts. I only want a few in there and I want them to make sense where they are. I don't want them to just be just random marks on the wood. And we're going to embed this 
in this. So we're going to embed that just a little bit. So I don't need to have a lot, but I want them to be deep enough so that they stick out a little bit. And that's not going to be in, in, embedded in there very deep, but we want at least that, that part to show at the bottom. So some of these deeper cuts, let me put one way over here in the corner, accentuate that one. Just make some deeper cuts in there. It adds more character to it. It adds a little bit more detail. Maybe that's not important to you. You just want to do this because you know you're going to take them out with your grandkids and put them put them out at the park and drop them at trees or put or you know whatever. Make sure you have permission if you're going to do that in a city or a state park, city, county, state park. Anytime you're doing it on somebody else's property, get permission before you do that. Mostly they don't care because it's interest that might draw people into the park. Use it a little more. But I've seen several of them, you know, kind of like I was saying in one of the other videos, that it looks like it reminds me of painted rocks. All right, anyway, I think we got a pretty good door. I'd come back and use uh, some kind of um, buffing wheel or something to, to take that those marks off. And then I'm going to take a little... I'd love to do it with a wood burner, so I'm, but I don't have that. So I'm going to take some a V tool or a, the smallest U gouge I have. I have a really tiny one. I'll have to have to dig that out. I think I got a small one. Anyway, I'm going to just to poke that in to make it look like that. I could always put a dowel in there, use a little dowel, drill a hole, put that in there, and then cut the top of it off. Really, almost flush with that, so it looks like it's bolted in. But for what we want now, this is good enough. I'm not going to worry about how the bottom feels <clears throat> because it's rough and it's going to go embedded on this on this piece of wood anyway. So there's the base and there's the there's the, the door that we're making. <clears throat> okay, so we're done here. I'm going to come over here and I'm going to use the same V tools I've been using. I don't want to go down a lot. I'm going to go down just enough. And this is cross grain because the grain <clears throat> on this runs the length of the wood. So when I go across, it's going to be Make sure your tools are sharp, otherwise you're going to end up with some recuts that you have to redo. But I'm just trying to remove that line that I drew. And then I'm going to come back in here with a, with a fishtail gouge, flat chisel, whatever you have, nearly flat. A number three and number five would work, depending on how deep you want this to go. But I just want this tucked in there. And if it doesn't match perfectly, again, there's nothing about this thing that is perfect. <clears throat> made the cut with my V-tool, make a stop cut right in the bottom of that groove, do my best to stay in that groove, and then I'm just going to come back with my fishtail, my number five, and I'm just going to make it. It doesn't have to be perfect, doesn't have to be flat, perfectly flat. Don't get out your micro calipers and measure how flat it is and how much deviation is there between this and then that one. Just go with it. I, I guess, like I said before, I taught school for a long time, and it seems like every time we turn around, teachers are having staff meetings, and we're discussing things that we need to know to, to make education better. And so you can hear the sarcasm in my voice. I apologize for those of you that are still teaching. I retired a couple years ago, and I think it was the worst thing I did financially, but the best thing I did mentally and emotionally and physically, too. Anyway, I worked for a principal for a year, and then she retired, and I worked for another guy for three years, and then he moved to a bigger school, and we got a principal that was, um, God, how do, I, how do I be nice about this? And my wife would say he's full of himself, been reading his own press, whatever that means. Anyway, the one thing I learned from him, and, and I, I really learned a lot from him, but the one thing I learned from him primarily was the was the need to embrace ambiguity. Education, when you're educating kids, you know, every day, you have, 30, you have 180 kids or whatever I had every day, and every day those kids were different. So every day I got a brand new set of 180 kids. And, and the colleagues were the same way. You know, come in one day, they're, they're, they're angry, and the next day they're really happy. And the ambiguity meant that there was nothing you could really count on. You could count on the bell going off as long as there weren't problems with the bells. But you couldn't count on a whole lot more because one day the parents were happy with you and singing your praises, and the next day they were upset that you, you know, caused little Johnny to cry over his C or his D on an assignment that he did poorly on. 
And so the ambiguity simply meant that I couldn't be, I couldn't rest on trying to expect everything be the same day after day after day. I had to be welcoming of the ambiguity that was taking place and, and knowing that nothing was going to be perfectly done. Okay, there we are. We're kind of embedded in there, kind of not, but it'll look okay. It'll leave some negative space. There will be some negative space down in here, and so that I'm going to use this for my door step, and I'm going to step that down one layer and step that down another layer, and then over here I'm going to put grass. I could do stone, <clears throat> excuse me, I could do bricks, rocks, whatever, but I think I'm just going to make that a stepping sill and then drop below. I have to worry because I don't have a lot of room here, so if I step it down one, i got to worry how far down I'm going to go. And so I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to embrace the ambiguity of that wood and what it's doing. In fact, this piece doesn't want to come off for some reason, and I'll turn it around a few times and... We'll get it squared away. There we go. That looks a little better. So anyway, I'm going to draw that in because where the where the edge of the door is, right there, and right there, I just want a little stoop kind of thing, little step, and then I'm going to have another one just a little bit farther out to make it so it looks more like another step, and we're just going to have that set there with a step there. Can you see that? See where I'm going with it? Okay. Now, this one isn't going to go down much, but that one's going to go down quite a bit. So I'm just going to take a V-tool. I'm going to cut in these lines here, and I'm going to cut in that line there, another line here, and another line there. I want to connect these two lines right here on the bottom, top stoop, I guess, and I'm going to connect these two lines here. And now we're going to have a little bit more fun with that ambiguity because we're going to we're going to we're going to lower this down. So stop cut. Stop cut. Stop cut. I have two choices here. I can drop this below that level or I can leave this level high and bring that up. I'm going to leave this level high out here and just bring this down just a little bit. So I'll make a stop cut right there in the middle. And then I'm going to come in here and I want to remove a little bit of that wood. Rather than pushing it out this way, if I push it that way, I'm pushing wood against itself. And so it doesn't, it's, it's less likely to crack off and, and split. I just want a little bit. I didn't go deep enough there. So there we go. Okay, we're down one step. Smooth it out. Take those saw marks off. Looky there, looky there. Kind of looks like a step, maybe. Do the same thing here. Stop cut, little stop cut there, little stop cut there, another stop cut. Stop cut in there. Gonna go, uh, you know what, I, I'm gonna leave this one higher than this one, so I'm only gonna take a little bit off of this, and I hopefully by the time we paint it, tool it, give it some texture it'll 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 look like what we want maybe I, I bet some of you are having a hard time seeing where I'm going but I'm gonna I'm going to I'll get you there trust me I'll get you there just go with my ambiguity okay so there's my door that I'll smooth down a little bit later with my uh, Dremel and some some scotch wrap pads but there's my doorstep now around here I probably want something like grass because it is a it is a hobo house, and so I'm just going to round the top edges. There's that sound I was talking about yesterday. Don't you just love that sound? Just listen. I'll turn around backwards. I don't know about you, but I just love that sound. I know I've told this story before. And I didn't start carving when I was, you know, five years old, although I probably could have. My grandpa Swanson on my mom's side, her dad, I've heard the story that he used to carve peach pits. Which, if you've ever dealt with peach pits, you know, they're kind of a hardwood. I would consider them a hardwood. But he carved those, and he made 
keychains out of them. Attached keychain to him. He didn't carve the chain. But he made keychains. And gave them away, sold them. I don't know what he did. I was told he gave them away. Maybe he sold them. Who knows? Anyway, I'm gonna take some of these saw marks off of this top of it because I wanna I wanna make this kind of look like grass when I'm done. Just trying something new. Anyway, so my grandfather carved. And my dad's dad was from Alabama, so my dad was was uh, an Alabamian, and we'd go back and visit his parents and his family. Uh, and my uncle Otis, my dad's uncle on his dad on his dad's side, his dad's name was Vester, and his uncle Otis ran a little store. I, I think I've said this in one of my videos earlier. Um, anyway, Alabama, Sand Mountain, Alabama, Fife to be to be precise, F Y F F E. And Uncle Otis had a small store there that people didn't want to drive all the way downtown or drive into the next nearest town or whatever. They would just come by and get, you know, the bare basics, groceries, milk, whatever. And he had a pot-bellied stove in there, and it seemed like there was always somebody carving, you know, when there were people visiting. There was always somebody in there fiddling around. There was some, guys, some, you know, some guys over there playing dominoes and somebody over there whittling. So I've been around it since I was young, but I didn't get into carving until... I was in my 30s. I started carving in scouts. And as a scout master, you want to keep your kids busy. So giving them a, a stick, a sharp knife and a stick, and letting them whittle on that around the campfire kept them from whittling on benches and kept them whittling on doorposts and things like that. It gave them something to do, something productive. So we kept it simple. We made it fun. Anyway, I didn't get into carving until later, and I wish I'd have started earlier, but I'm having fun now, and that's all that's important. Just using my tools to clean up what I'm doing here. So I think we're just about done with this. I would take, I'm going to take a big gouge, a shallow gouge. I got this two-handled one that's a number seven. You see that number seven right there? And I'm just going to, to texture that. So let's just, we're just going to texture. I don't want the, I don't throw, I want the grass going like it's a, Golf course, you know how you know how manicured they want that to look, because you know they're trying to get the ball in the hole, get in the hole. Anyway, I'm just gonna get, I'm gonna give it some texture, and then we're gonna come back with a V tool, and we'll add some grass in there. So, try, I'm trying to do this fairly quickly because it's just, this is this is tedious work. Just you know, once you've done one section of grass, it's gonna look a lot like the next one. As opposed to ears, you you know you do 15 ears and they all look a little different. You want grass to kind of look a little different, but either way, you're still you got to embrace the ambiguity of the grass and it doing what it wants on this wood that's going to do what it wants and and just have a little bit of fun. So we just gave it some texture. I would come back with a V tool and I'm just going to randomly make grass go in every different direction. And try to make it look like the grass that we were putting on the on the picture. So again, just random cuts, short grass is you know not most of them don't grow real tall unless they're decorative landscape grasses. But we're just trying to make that grass look funny. Uh, not funny, look like it's fairly consistent, but like it's you know laying down in some spots and standing up in others. It's kind of hard to do that on this thin piece of wood. But we're just adding, going into those each of those little divots and just going in there and just having a little bit of fun. You bring it all the way up to the edge of the door because that's where the grass would grow. Anyway, that's what we're going to do with that. So we'll move on to that. Move on past that. I don't usually tool the back of them. I leave the back of them flat so that they can rest up against the wall. So this part and this part will be flush whether we glue it or, or screw it. And I like screwing them on this thicker piece of wood. For classes, pardon me, all my noise. For classes, I'll use thinner pieces like this. Most of my classes are three hours long. And when we start to do that kind of carving, carve brand new beginner carvers will get get tied down in the minutia. This right here will take them 20 minutes. This right here would take them an hour and a half. So in the interest of making them 
giving them a chance to finish instead of using the inch thick wood I use thinner wood and it works better for them because then they slow down a little bit as far as getting uh, the tedium out and they start working on the on the actual details and dimensions of it. I like it and I have fun doing it and I think that's that's what's important is if you're having fun but I use the thinner stuff rather than the thicker stuff you can see the difference between those two I use the thinner stuff for class. Um, if I'm doing a if I'm doing a class outside of where I normally teach, then I would use th thicker stuff because we have more time. But I teach at Woodcraft, and they give me three hours to teach a class. And you know how much can you get done in 30 minutes if you've never carved? That's that's the whole question there. So I'm trying I'm, I'm trying to come up with new projects that I can do that people would really be, enjoy doing it, and then still have a chance of getting it done. All right, we are done with this door with the exception of one thing. Somewhere in here, we've got to worry about what kind of knob it's going to be, and so we'll, we'll, we'll navigate that a little bit later. Off camera, I'll finish tooling this and move on, because I don't want to spend the next, you know, three hours doing, doing grass. You can do that on your own and, uh, and, and spend a little bit of time. I want to move to the gnome. Now, I did a real quick one. took me about 15 minutes to do this guy. They're real simple, and you can see I still have saw marks on it because I wasn't trying to get the whole detail. I wasn't trying to really get the ear in. I'm just trying to make sure that that size was okay. Well, let me show you what that looks like when we put it up next to the door. He's going to be standing somewhere like this or somewhere off to the side. Either way, he's just a gnome, and he fits in the door. And if you, I'm going to, I'm going to carve a gnome from my piece of wood. And as I said yesterday, I think I measured this out yesterday, and I measured it out to be a little over, little right at one inch, maybe an inch and an inch and, and a sixteenth from front to back. Looks like it's about the same width, inch and a sixteenth, inch and inch and an eighth from back from side to side. And then top to bottom looks like it's about three and a quarter inches. And right in the middle I cut for the legs. I cut out the profile for the bottom, the, 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 the buttocks. I cut the profile out for the shoes. I cut the profile out for the hat head and I cut the profile out for the hat. And so when we go to carve this thing, we want to start with our center line. I'll put these, if I, re if I remember, I'll try to remember to put these, these plans for that and for this in, in, the, in the description for the YouTube video. I've done a lot of figures where the arms were tucked in, so I feel comfortable doing that. I'm going to draw a line here separating the head and the body. I bet it would help you if I did it in black. I'm sorry. My wife is always getting on to me about it. I do it in black so you can see it. There's the shoes. There's the bottom of the hat. There's the belly. How to come up somewhat like that, however how you carve a gnome hat or a, or a hobbit hat. And then I want to figure out somewhere down here is where the pockets are going to be. So I'm going to draw, I'm going to draw with pencil first because I want my pocket front pocket to be right there. The arm comes up like that. And I feel fairly comfortable with this dimension without measuring it because I've done a lot of these little kind of things. So when we draw that, the front of the pocket, make it easier. Don't stick his hands out of his pocket. Um, you can. Feel free to do that. This is primarily a beginner video. Or you can have him with his hands sticking out holding a stick, you know, like a, a walking stick, whatever. But I feel comfortable with that being where I want to go. And so I'm going to start with the hat. I'm going to go down to the boots. I'm going to round the body, and then I'm going to finally add a lot of the details. Now, in an inch and a half carving, there's a limit to what how much details you can add in there. In fact, we'll use a lot of the principles behind flat plane carving. If you can zoom in a little bit, you see that high plane? How close can I get it? It's really flat. The nose is flat. The eye plane is flat because we don't need to add a whole lot. And in fact, when it goes to painting, <clears throat> man, I don't want to paint in there. I really don't. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a dot, a, a splash of white and a dot, just like the old flat plane carvers used to do, the trigs and the 